Today on CyberWork, we have Tyler Hatch of DFI Forensics. Tyler tells us about moving from being a lawyer into the field of digital forensics, the key traits of a great forensics professional, and how to prove that incriminating evidence on a defendant's laptop isn't always what it seems. That's all today on CyberWork. Also, I want to tell you about a new hands-on training series called CyberWork Applied. Every week, expert InfoSec instructors and industry practitioners teach you a new cybersecurity skill and show you how that skill applies to real-world scenarios. You'll learn how to carry out different cyber attacks, practice using common cybersecurity tools, and follow along with walkthroughs of how major breaches occurred, and more. And it's free. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash learn or check out the link in the description and get started with hands-on training in a fine environment today. It's a new way to learn crucial cybersecurity skills and keep the skills you have relevant. That's infosecinstitute.com slash learn. And now on with the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Our guest today, Tyler Hatch, was born and raised in suburban Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, following a six-year legal career that include representing clients in legal proceedings and small claims, Supreme Court, and a variety of administrative tribunals in British Columbia. Tyler found his way into the fascinating world of digital forensics and never looked back. After spending some time with a Vancouver-based digital forensics firm, Tyler formed DFI Forensics in July of 2018. He's also the host of the Digital Forensics Files podcast, fellow podcaster here. I wanted to get him on for that reason as well. Tyler is a certified computer forensics examiner, uh, CCFE, and a certified mobile forensics examiner, CMFE, and is always training and receiving education to further his knowledge and understanding of computer forensics, IT forensics, digital forensics, cybersecurity, and incident response. He is a frequent contributor of written articles to various legal and digital forensics publications, including AdvocateDaily.com, LawyersDaily.ca, eForensics Magazine, and Digital Forensics Magazine. Tyler, thanks for very much for joining us today on CyberWork. That's my pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Great. Yep. Yeah, uh, glad to have you on board. Um, our listeners are always excited about uh, forensics topics. Our, our forensics episodes are always uh, sort of um, very well, very well watched. So, uh, so we like to always start out because a lot of people are interested in forensics and a lot of people here are maybe thinking about it as a career or just getting started. So uh, how did you first get interested in tech and specifically in cybersecurity and in and forensics? Yeah, big question. So I've always been on a consumer level, very interested in technology, whether it be, um, you know, back when I was younger, like TVs, going to DVDs and Blu-rays and the upgrades in technology through my life. And, and I was born in the 70s. So uh, I grew up not on the internet and, and these kind of things. So to suddenly have this kind of technology just fascinated me. I always tried to embrace it. Uh, when I was a practicing lawyer, I always tried to use technology to uh, make written notes, for example, and you know, use an earpiece while I'm talking to somebody to take notes better rather than just handwriting stuff and, right. you know, keeping things paperless and online and things like that. Um, and as I did that, and, and as my career as a lawyer progressed, and I realized how important it was to prove things with um, a finite degree of probability and certainty, uh, I just naturally started to think about forensics and I sort of became aware of it a little bit. Um, but you know, I, I stopped practicing law in 2010 and, and this was still very much an emerging field and technology. You know, we were in sort of like the beginnings of the iPhones and, and right. Blackberry, but not really terribly advanced. So to see where it's become now and just to see the amount that people are using technology, um, it's amazing to see the digital footprint that gets left everywhere. And yeah. so, you know, in our modern world to be able to prove, you know, what somebody was doing, what did they know? How did they do something? What do they communicate? It's just, it just fascinates me. Um, so I, I kind of got sucked in. Uh, so to answer your question, how did I get into the field? I actually took a break from law for health reasons for several years. And okay. in about 2017, I started to see that I wanted to go back and I was healthy enough to go back into law. Um, in, in the meantime, while they were processing my application, I needed a job. And I happened to see a, um, an opportunity come up for this Vancouver-based forensics firm that had been around for a long time. And they said they're their clients were lawyers and, and that's what I was going into. And it seemed like a really good opportunity in the field. I, although I didn't really know what it was um, to the degree that it was uh, just obviously it's very interesting and seems a lot of fun. So 
I ended up getting that opportunity and I just, you know, it just captured me in a way that I've never experienced. It made me so passionate about it. And I just said, forget about law. I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, um, for, for a number of reasons, I, I started my own company doing it. Um, and yeah, I just, it's such a great feel. And just to see the advancement um, over the last couple of years is just, it's so fascinating. I'm so glad that I'm a part of it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the difference in procedure between being a lawyer and being sort of a forensics person in, in the sort of, you know, cause you're, 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 you're definitely still in law based things, but you're sort of coming at it from a different point of view, more of a, a detective side of things rather than, you know, so can you sort of talk about where some of the um, parallels are, where some of the divergences are. And also, I mean, it sounds like, you know, people in a, in a law background would be especially suited to sort of uh, forensics work. You, do you find that to be the case? Very much. Law enforcement, um, as well as a legal background is, is so beneficial. And the reason why is because lawyers, one of their primary roles is to gather facts and put together a case. You know, your client will come in and they'll tell you a story and this story results in now a lawsuit. So you have to verify what they're saying. You have to find verifiable information to back up that story or prove the case. And then you have to advise the client, you know, this is how much we can prove your case. And based on that, I'm going to apply the law. And you go through then the procedural aspects of going to court or whatever forum that you're in. Um, so my role now, while I understand the overall context of legal proceedings very well, I'm only charged with the task of gathering that evidence and proving or disproving a theory or a factual assumption. Yep. Uh, and, and really just telling the story based on a, on a device, you know, and a, a lot of people, again, I say this all the time, but it's so funny. People are like, wow, digital forensics, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And then their next question almost invariably is what the hell does that mean? What is it? Yeah. You know, so I'll give you an example of a case that I'm working on that's kind of tragic, but also very interesting. Please. For years, I've wondered why distracted driving cases, text messaging while you're driving hasn't come up more and more. Like our phone should be ringing off the hook. Right. Um, the amount of accidents that involve distracted driving. Um, we're only now working on the first case. Um, and it's actually from an old iPhone from 2013 where there's a, um, you know, a suspicion that one of the drivers may have been distracted by his phone. So we look at the phone, we see, you know, what was going on at the time? What was, was it powered on? Was it unlocked? Were you receiving any information? Were you online? Um, and that fascinates me. And we can yeah. tell very clearly down to the second or the the tenth of a second what exactly was going on wow. and it's so useful um yeah so it's a great example of just sort of telling a story right and yeah and i, I think that's also a thing worth worth uh emphasizing and I hope you can talk about it a little bit is is just the storytelling aspect of forensics in general because it's you know it it, it it it'd be easy enough to sort of corrupt the idea of forensics and sort of think of it in terms of like you know ncis or or you know, CSI or whatever, where it's all just like high tech and, you know, just it might be sort of out of people's range, but like the tech is not necessarily that high, but like you say, the, the storytelling and the problem solving aspects are, are a bigger part of it. Is that correct? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and a good point is anybody who um, is going in with a particular view. Um, in other words, if you go in assuming that something happened and, and you want to cherry pick evidence, this is not the field for you. Mm -hmm. You really want to go in with a blank slate and collect everything and understand what the evidence is telling you. And there's a very big difference there. Um, for example, we recently did a case um, where somebody was charged with having certain, being in possession of material on their computer. And at first blush, if you're sort of like, I'm a cop and he's, this is a bad guy, and you're looking at the computer, you see material there. Um, you see the same material on a USB drive. You would think that somebody committed a crime and this gentleman was charged with a crime and he was out on bail and he wasn't allowed to use the phone for three years or something like that. Um, and finally, the criminal lawyer came to us and we actually examined the evidence that the police examined. And yes, the material was there, but you can't stop there. You have to understand how did it get there? Why is it there? What do we know about it? This was actually somebody who purchased a laptop on Craigslist. So it was a used, mm. user. and yes, the evidence was there, but it was under a profile, like a user profile that was not him. And the time frame was way outside of the time that he actually oh. uh, bought the computer. So yeah. that's all that. Okay, then the next question is, well, then why is it on a USB? When, you, when your guy made a copy of the drive, now it's on the USB. Great, that looks bad too. But he just made a backup of the entire computer to a USB drive, which then includes all of the user profiles, um, including the one that was the issue. Um, and that case got dropped immediately. 
Um, wow. And this gentleman, you know, was off these charges. And all we did is tell them the truth. Yeah. You know, all it is bring that to light. Um, something will look bad at first. There's more to the story. And when you uncover that, um, you know, it's all about truth and justice and doing the right thing. And that's, that's what I felt really good about in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you tell me some more? What are, do you have any other sort of highlight uh, cases that you've worked on with, with DFI that you're especially proud of or are especially might be interesting to listeners? I think that one was um, probably the highlight of 2020 for me in terms okay. of last year, just in terms of the result, because it was yeah. so good. And, um, and, you know, sometimes people do these bad things and you have to tell that too. And that's fair. Oh, yeah. um, but the other thing I think that we were involved in this year that I found just so interesting was a ransomware attack. And it, it actually hit one of our Northern Canadian territories. Um, I was one of the power companies actually. Um, and it took down their network. I mean, what, what, people under, what people have to understand is when the spread of malware starts encrypting backups, um, you just take systems offline. That's what you do. That's why these large cities in the U.S. get shut down for months at a time and all of a sudden their um, operations aren't online anymore. It's a real problem. Um, but, you know, providing an essential service like power is really important, especially in northern Canada where it's kind of yeah. cold. So, you know, it was very important that we do work quickly and understand, you know, how this person got into the network and launched this payload that disrupted this entire area. Um, and it was a very vast spread out network, uh, IT network. There were a lot of locations. And um, all the credit to my senior forensic examiner, Giuseppe Lim, he found in literally hundreds and thousands of logs of events, the tiniest, most innocuous needle in a haystack where the attacker exploited a known vulnerability, but very obscure. It was actually a mm -hmm. printer spool, uh, a very small sort of service that allowed them to sort of get some credentials, uh, then pivot to another area of the network and elevate um, privileges and do what he did. Um, but, you know, it's amazing how you can tell something like that and stop it um, from the smallest little needle in a haystack. Can you tell me a little bit about your staff? You mentioned your, your senior researcher. How, how big of a research staff and how many like facilitators and so forth do you manage? What you, and, and also, what is the, to that end, what is the size and scope of the types of cases you work with? It sounds like you're working with you know, Canadian territories and stuff, so you, you're apparently getting like pretty, pretty big cases. But can you, can you talk about like, the size of DFI Forensics as a, as a group? Yeah, we, we're pretty small. So um, at this point, we're a, a new company and a young company. In order to grow, you have to grow smart. So we all do a lot. We recognize we're a new company. And um, I have a very committed team of three people, including myself. Um, and, but they're very high level. And what I do is I hire good people and I let them do their job. Yep. Uh, not prepared to do it. You, there's no time to micromanage and, and do all this kind of stuff. If you're going to hire somebody and bring them on, you need to trust them and their skill set. And so I've done that. So um, Giuseppe is my senior guy. He was educated in Korea. He worked in Korea. He worked in um, New York, New York for the prosecutor's office. He has a master's uh, degree in computer science. Uh, he's an MK certified forensic examiner. Uh, he, he's it's like 10 years of experience and he's just, you know, that the education side is remarkable with Giuseppe. But what makes him so good is that he's just got that innate desire to do everything that he can to solve yeah. the problem. And that's really what probably your students or, or some of the, the people who might be listening to this podcast would want to know. Um, training is great and we all need it. We have to understand the technology and what we're looking for. But that desire to drive the investigation to the very furthest point that it can go is, is just so invaluable. So uh, that uh, that's uh, always worth repeating. And, and you know, all, all of our forensic people have said that too, like people who are problem solvers, people who aren't, aren't willing to let it go until they're absolutely certain that they've done every possible thing. And, and also, like I say, good storytellers. But um, so to turn around the other way to the training and the uh, skill side of things, what are some, some things that people should be learning or studying or getting involved with if they want to prepare for a career in digital forensics or, you know, pivot from another cybersecurity job into digital forensics? What, what, what certs, what projects should they, you know, work on? What sorts of like demonstrations, things like that? Yeah. I mean, it all starts with an interest in the field and a passion for the field. Um, yep. I like, you know, the, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent, but, you know, cybersecurity and digital forensics are two sides to the same coin um, yeah. of, of cybersecurity and, and cyber attacks. Similar to how you have um, courtroom lawyers and solicitors who do the agreements and all those kind of things, wills and estates and, 
So solicitors will plan for an event that has not happened yet, and they'll try to formulate agreements and written um, documents that contemplate all the ways in which that, that event can go wrong. When something goes wrong, this, the litigators come in and we, we fight about an event and we dissect it and we apply the law to it. That's very similar to this in the sense that once a cyber attack occurs, that's where forensics comes in. That's where you're doing the incident response. All the stuff that leads up to that, in my opinion, is cybersecurity and the prevention aspects. I find that most students and most people in the field providing the services are almost, I, I would say 90% or more are in cybersecurity. And there's not a lot of people doing forensics, um, particularly in Canada. Um, so I, I think if I was a student, I would probably go into that uh, field in terms of it, it's a growing field. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that it's, you can do all the training you want, but you need experience. So the, the, the biggest bar to entry into the field is getting that experience. And I really right. feel students in that way. Um, you know, I don't know where I would be had I not started my own company. Right. Um, you know, certainly in the early days, in the early days, I was not certified. I was not educated enough to actually do the work. And it was always my goal to have a team that did the work. Out of pure interest, I then got certifications through InfoSec Institute. Um, and I continue to develop my training and, and skills. So I'm currently, you know, writing the, the uh, NK certification. I'm doing some stuff with Celebrate. I'm working with Paraben uh, for their E3 training. Uh, so I'm trying to broaden my skills and you're always trying to learn. And to be honest with you, just the curiosity factor, when I'm using my cell phone, I'm always curious, you know, what is this app and, and what is this new feature? And would I know about what I'm doing if I had this phone in an investigation? You know, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. So just that kind of curiosity factor. Uh, and so what can students do? They can, they can write articles, they can do research, they can, they can play around with free tools and, you know, extract your own data and see how you would get it. Um, if you understand how to do that with a free tool, I promise you, you'll be better in the field when you're using a paid tool that does all of that work for you in a much more efficient way. Yeah. Um, you know, but there are free tools available that you can just tinker around with and, and you get to do it in uh, not a real world experience where the consequences of making a mistake aren't so dire. And that's yes. how we learn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what would you say it would be a good first certification to, for, for an aspiring uh, forensics professional to start working toward? Yeah, hands down. Um, and one of the reasons why I contacted you is because I'm so proud of going through the InfoSec Institute training. Um, so when I was starting my company a couple of years ago and realizing that I wanted to get certified, it wasn't easy to find the money or the time to do it. And one of the things I was blown away by the value of InfoSec. I was looking at the boot camp courses and, and things like that. And they tended to be, they tended at that time to be very expensive packages and a large commitment of time. Um, but what you developed was a program, um, sorry, Flex, I believe it was called back mm -hmm. then. Um, where you can sign up for a year and it was so it was such a great price point and you could do it at your own pace and the skill sets and pathways to learning and certifications were so broad um, at that time and that's how I got my my intro certifications and I really okay. got you know some great training there um, and now I, I look at that program and I'm still a member because the training is great and they've added labs and and all these kind of uh, techniques and and uh, skill sets just beyond watching training videos. So right. it's far more interesting to, to do. And, you know, the, again, the skill set is so broad. Cool. Um, so I want to sort of walk, uh, have you walk us through aspects of digital forensics, uh, you know, in, in the sort of application aspect. I mean, obviously, not everyone on your team is doing the testifying in court and not everyone is doing, uh, you know, the research and stuff like that. Can you sort of, can you tell me a little bit about the way your your team breaks down in terms of who does what and you know and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people wear multiple hats and so forth but like what are the what are the different um sort of key points to your your forensics team right um so i just by sort of consequence of it being my business i'm the intake person so i get all the phone calls and emails um and some of them are a good fit for us and some of them are not and, and it's very important for me to to talk to people and have a good no charge consultation where i'm, I'm like you know a lot of people think their devices have been hacked, for example. There's some very serious conversations that have to happen with that for them to understand, you know, the, the chance of them being hacked, how the technology works, how we can help, how much it's going to cost, all of these kinds of things. And I'm the first one to say, 
this is not a good fit. You're just going to spend a bunch of money and we're not going to be able to tell you. Anything. Um, so I, I do that. And then, you know, with the legal cases, I take that. And, and once I have a better idea for the circumstance, the surrounding facts, what devices are involved and what evidence we can get off it and how we can sort of help contribute to the problem, um, then I delegate it to the team. And the way I do that is, is specifically, you know, is this something that's likely to go to court? So I probably want somebody senior on that. I want somebody with specific experience and qualifications on that. You know, is it a really technical issue that's going to require some very um, tricky communication uh, and, and some technical language that needs to be put into plain language for a tribunal or a court? Right. Um, in those situations, I favor myself being involved because I can bridge the two worlds fairly well. And, and you know, I, I got the chance to go into court a couple weeks ago and I could see the expression on the, uh, the judge's face where he was just like, I don't understand any of this. And he's almost uh, yeah. like, you know, rubbing his eyes going like, what are you guys even talking about? And just knowing that I can slow it down and I can, you know, draw, draw his attention to parts of my report where there were visual representations of what I was talking about, and screenshots. Um, so yeah, we just delegate the work that way. And to answer your question, not everything goes to court. Um, right. often, okay. often they do. But we, we do work for private individuals as well. And sometimes those cases have nothing to do with court. Mm. Um, and so it, that, that contributes to my thought process when I'm assigning the file to one of our examiners or researchers, as you uh, alluded to. Okay. Um, and do you have anyone on your team whose sole or primary job is just the sort of writing storytelling aspect of it, who maybe doesn't have a lot of tech background, but is able to explain the concepts you know, in a, in a way that, as you say, the, uh, the eye rubbing judge can easily understand. Yeah. It's always best for somebody when they're writing. First of all, everybody gets a, a written report of what we did and, and what right. we found, and how it relates to what they hired us for. Um, it's always best if the examiner who worked on that file produces the report. So okay. I have a date and, you know, well, pretty much everyone has to have the writing skills as well as whatever other tech skills they have. hundred percent communication, yeah. verbal communication, uh, writing skills is so important. And just to be able to apply logic, you know, I, I was asked to do A, I did B, C, and D, I found E, F, and G, it means blah, blah, blah. Like, there's a very specific way that you have to lay out the information. And, and not everybody can cut through that uh, in a very uh, efficient way when there's an overall complicated back pattern. So it's not easy. And writing is very difficult when you're trying to, when you've done something. And right. so I always encourage people to write, get the practice, do that but I sort of oversee the final product and I always sort of look at the draft and I revise as necessary and, and maybe ask for more detail or more clarification. Sometimes there's follow-up work, that kind of thing. So it's always good to have a second set of eyes on it as well. Is there, has there ever been a case where you just weren't able to convey what you found to a judge or a, you know, a case, you know, with it within a case where, where they were just like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, or do you always eventually kind of get over yeah, it's always a challenge. So there's a lot of cases where we can't avoid being technical to some degree. Sure. And what, you know, I'll go back to that power company case where it was a very complicated um, scenario. And we're trying to communicate to both the IT team and the executives who are in charge of making the decision. Those are two very different audiences. So we do what, you know, we, we tend to do like an executive summary in plain language, broad stroke, strokes, the 30,000 foot view, if you will. And then we actually set out the minutia in uh, another part of the report that's specifically for the IT people to understand. And we know that on the heels of our investigation, there's going to be a cybersecurity team to avoid it from happening next time. So they want that information uh, in a very technical way so that they can work with it. So it's always about um, communicating what you did to your audience and the person that, that hired you. So I want to talk about your podcast, uh, the Digital Forensics Files. Can you walk me through an average episode and like what types of guests you get and what levels of forensics professionals the podcast is aimed at? Yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, obviously, I'm very passionate about what I do. And I just wanted to start creating some content around our field. And I noticed that uh, a couple of years ago, there wasn't anything uh, like it. There's now a few, which is great. The more information we can get out there, the better. Right. And, um, yeah, and just in terms of getting some ideas together for content and guest and format and all that kind of stuff, I actually um, made a post on our, our Facebook group for digital forensics. 
And all of a sudden, this really nice lady named Amber started messaging me saying, hey, great idea. I've got some people you might want to talk to um, and just communicating with her. I'm like, oh, you know, tell me about what you do. She's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the owner of Paraben. And my eyes went about, you know. Yeah, 30, I've, I've had Amber on the show twice. She's amazing. Yeah. I noticed that. Yeah, no, and she's <laughs> so great. And, and one of the things that I love about her is just that she's so passionate after all the time that she spent in the field and everything that she's been yeah. able to do that she's still hanging out in these little Facebook groups just because she loves it. I, I find right. that just, I'm all struck by Amber and everything that she's done. And, sure. you know, even, even on a case the other day, I, I, you know, I thought I had done everything that I could and I hit a roadblock um, due to technology and encryption that really just can't get around. But I, I wanted to ask somebody um, outside of the organization just to get a second set of eyes. And I was able to just, you know, get some ideas from her and, and wow. just she's so available and willing to help uh, blows me away. Like I really, really look up to her, uh, as a professional and, and somebody, a, a business person, frankly, and just a great human being. Right. Um, yeah. And she's been on my podcast as well. And she's, she's just a really cool person. And, um, although she would tell you that she's a dork, but she is not <laughs> <laughs> just because you like star Wars and, um, you know, wonder woman doesn't make you a dork. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty much uh, everybody now at this point. Um, so what would be some like key episodes of, if people want to get started with your podcast, what do you think, where, where do you think, like, wh- which are some of the guests I'm, I'm guessing Amber's one of them, but like which episodes would be most exciting uh, for people who's just, who are just getting into it? Yeah, it depends. Um, it depends what your interest is. So yeah. I have forensics professionals. Um, you know, Brett Shavers is a industry professional and he's just got a cool background. You know, he's very understated and modest. I would, I would encourage people to just sort of check out that one. I mean, this guy like swims with sharks. He's been, he just lived a crazy life. Um, but he's the most understated and gentle guy. Um, so that was a fun one for me, albeit it was short. Some people like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I prefer to, I like the ones where I'm talking to lawyers um, just because I have that natural bond with them. Right. Uh, a lot of employment lawyers that are on or the, the cybersecurity impress- professionals that sort of spearhead the post cyber attack investigation when there's a data breach and we need to do an investigation. You know, we, we get forensics involved, IT executives, legal, uh, public relations people. Uh, it's a really important multifaceted thing. So I like the ones where we talk about that um, as well. And and then I just have a bunch of cybersecurity professionals because I'm always trying to encourage information to get out there that helps people put real practical solutions into their business um, to to, to make a difference every day, to minimize your risk and stuff like that. So the ones where I have cybersecurity professionals on are are really my favorites as well. Okay. Yeah, so I want to jump back to uh, the sort of as- the employment aspect of things, and you talked a little bit about how you you found your team and and your 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 researchers and so forth. But and we also talked about how difficult it is to kind of get experience when you're just starting, mm-hmm. or or even to sort of show that experience to people who might potentially be hiring you. So, what are people who are hiring in digital forensics looking for in candidates, and how if you are trying to apply for these type of positions, do you show yourself to be an above average candidate and sort of float to the top of the pile? Um, so for me, I always encourage people and the people that I've noticed the most are the people who are active on LinkedIn. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a really great free way for you to get involved in conversations and, you know, just liking posting and, and commenting on things is a great way to get noticed. And, and all of a sudden you're, you're noticing somebody who's passionate and interested and you connect with the right. We're all on LinkedIn, to be honest with you. Um, right. You know, like, I mean, people in the industry. So if you want to yeah. connect free, it's a great way to do it. Um, and those are the people that I've tried to work with. So uh, before COVID shut down, I was looking at a more um, immediate plan to expand in the U.S. And I had a couple of uh, associates that were not full-time employees, but if I needed them in, in a particular area, uh, I had a contract with them so I could use them. And so they were sort of associates of the company. Um, and particularly Felicia Newton, um, just caught my eye as somebody who was doing so much to sort of mm. kick down doors and get into the industry. And for me, I thought if this is somebody who wants this kind of position so badly, I want to be working with her and develop her skills. And, you know, unfortunately we've had to kind of scale back a little bit and move away. So, um, she understands that very professional, um, I also tried to expand into Toronto earlier this year for the same reason I had to kind of scale it back. But, um, you know, my employee at the time, Ramya, Ramya Raghavan, uh, she connected with somebody that I'm close to in Vancouver. They put me in touch and just to sort of guide her career. 
um, sort of like the advice that I'm giving now. And when I met her, she was so passionate and she was just so willing to learn and just the kind of professional that I wanted to develop that I actually put her through the InfoSec training, um, mm -hmm. despite her not even being an employee, I just wanted to help her. And, um, you know, she just, she sank her teeth into that and really, you know, attacked it. And I thought again, wow, this person's so passionate that I, I made her an offer for um, a full-time position in, in Toronto, um, which unfortunately we had to scale back in. So she's moved on to another opportunity and I wish her all the best, but that's the kind of thing that I look for. And Rami had an excellent IT background. She worked as sort of um, an IT person. So she was very aware of the technology that we deal with. She was very good with communicating verbally and in writing and just the passion. So speaking of, of difference between your, your Vancouver office and your Toronto office and so forth, how has, has, has COVID and, and lockdowns and working from home and so forth affected forensics in general and your company specifically? Do you have uh, multiple teams in different cities? Do you try and stay central? Do you, how, like how close, how closely do you meet? I'm sure it's not face to face right now, but like how, how tightly knit do you, you have to be in, in, in the work right now? Um, so our team, if we have to be in the lab to use the technology and, and plug drives and switch dongles for various software that we use, that's, that's important. And we're there regularly, but sometimes you can set something up. If you're doing a multi-day investigation, they're just using TeamViewer and remoting in, which is really cool. Um, in terms of collecting the evidence, we actually, we're pretty stationary in Vancouver here now. Our, our team in our office in the lab is set up here in Vancouver. Um, even when we're hired by people within the city limits they still send the devices to us by courier um we're never going we're, we're very rarely going on site to collect the evidence from from lawyers and things like that we get them sent from their clients or the law office um so there's no magic to being on the ground but sometimes there's an urgency uh, or a particular file that does require somebody to be on site so that's why i was trying to expand into toronto because occasionally people um either required us to be there or they weren't comfortable currying an important piece of evidence to us. And I understand that, but in the vast majority of cases, it's perfectly fine. And with couriers, we can keep track of, you know, through the, um, the records that they keep chain of custody, which is always important for evidence and going to court and things like that. Um, so yeah, the, my, my plan from day one with this company was to be really efficient and paperless and um, have a smaller operation so that we can pass that value along to our clients. Uh, it's a very expensive field if you're actually a, a somebody who uses the service, it's so specialized that mm. the market demands that you, I mean, the tools you have to use, the liability that you incur if you do it wrong, um, you know, you can't water down your fees. At the same time, we're very focused on providing value. Um, so before somebody goes down the expensive road of, of hiring somebody like us, that's why I have these talks up front. So they know not only all the great things that we can do, but also some of the ways that, you know, there's a risk here that this might not materialize. And you know, here's the challenges that we might face in a particular case. And, you know, if you want to take that risk, we're happy to do the work, but you have to understand fully the benefits and the, the risk uh, of our work. Okay. Uh, so as we sort of look down the road a bit, where do you see uh, forensics investigation and, and related fields like breach mitigation and risk management going in the next five or 10 years? Uh, you know, I have to imagine they're all sort of growing fields, just like all areas of cybersecurity are, but do you see any procedural or technical or tool-based uh, options coming down the pike that are going to change the game in any way? I think it's going to be a growing field in terms of the demand from from people who use their services now, I think it's also going to be more challenging from a technical point because as things move to smart devices and phones and tablets, and uh, you just see all the increases in security and encryption uh, happening now, that makes our job really difficult. Um, MacBooks, for example, they continually come out with uh, specific chips and processors that make their data really challenging to work with. I mean, super secure, uh, but they, these aren't developed for us to, to do what we do. They're right. developed for consumers to be able to use them easily and securely. And that's great, but it certainly makes our job more difficult. So we're going to have to get more technical and we're going to have to keep up to date on the emerging, emerging technology. But certainly cyber attacks and cyber fraud is not going anywhere. So it's going to be a booming right. business for years and years to come. Uh, personally, what I think is going to be uh, a couple of things that are going to have to change in order for us to tackle this whole cybersecurity issue. Um, one, I think we're going to have to stop being anonymous on the internet to some degree. I don't think it's doing anyone any favors to be able to hide behind 
an IP address that doesn't, you know, there has to be some way that the, there, there can be um, an organization who knows both the identity of somebody who's related to that IP address, but doesn't allow advertisers and people who are trying to attack those people to get that information easily. There, there just has to be a better process. I mean, right now, if somebody does a ransomware attack to my business today, you know, at best, we're, we're getting an IP address somewhere else in the world. And we don't even try to catch that person. We don't even try. We just try to remove access so they can't do any more damage. And it certainly doesn't encourage somebody to then not try it again. You know, it doesn't discourage people from doing this. Um, so it's only going to get um, more and more problematic. I also see that things are going to have to be changed by legislation um, in terms of businesses just having to become more aware that this is a problem. Right now, we're relying on people to understand that it's a problem and make business decisions to minimize that risk. And the message just isn't hitting home, uh, certainly not quick enough. Anybody who's ever experienced a ransomware attack or any kind of cyber attack on their business knows how important it is now and they do everything they can. But there's still people who are so um, casual about it and dismissive of it over minimal costs. And um, it's a real problem. It's kind of like decades ago when we in instituted you know, legal requirements to wear seatbelts in cars. Everybody with any ounce of common sense knew that you know, driving in a motorized hunk of metal might result in injury to you if you get in a car accident, um, knows that. But a lot of people didn't wear seatbelts until they were forced to do it. And I, I don't like that that's probably where it's going, but I think that's what is going to have to happen to affect some real change. It's going to have to be regulation and, and requirements and probably penalties. Can you, can you wave a magic gavel and sort of give me an idea of what your ideal uh, sort of legislation to so solve this? Like what, what would be the things that you would, uh, in a package like that, what would you absolutely want to see? Um, I think they're already starting to develop. I just don't think the, the, the teeth is there. Um, so you see a lot of legislation happening right now where there is liability on the decision makers of businesses if they ignore cybersecurity. And, and then there's large scale public damage um, as a result of information getting out that affects a large number of people. Um, part of the problem in Canada, you may not appreciate the difference in um, damage awards when you sue somebody, but in Canada, they're fairly limited compared to the US. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we could sue somebody all day long for a data breach and they're only going to get, you know, entitled to if they actually suffered damage. So if you actually had your identity breach and you suffered a loss. So you tend to just get these companies that get a slap on the wrist, provide everybody who is breached uh, with two years credit monitoring, and they're just willing to accept that ex expense. But if you maybe penalize these companies more for really flagrant violations, I'm not suggesting that anybody should be penalized for marginal or um, well-intentioned but insufficient right. measures. Um, but ones who are really bad, I mean, you look at the Marriott breach from a couple of years ago where yep. you know, somebody was literally in there for years stealing records. Yeah. Um, an organization the size of Marriott um, certainly had a budget. Um, there's really no excuse not to detect that and be aware of it. Um, and those are the kind of instances where I think we really have to make examples of people um, to affect real change. And that, that could be a case where there was punitive damages. I don't know, but you know, certainly... Um, I just got some notice in the mail that I may have been part of it and here's yeah. some credit. Monitoring. That's great. But, you know, maybe something with a little bit more teeth. And, and in Canada, we do have some legislation that makes people liable, but, you know, nobody thinks for a minute that anybody's going to go to jail for that, even though the legislation allows that to, to happen or that anybody's even going to be fined significantly for it. So I think having some real teeth behind it um, will be important. But, you know, with everything going on in the world, it's so hard to get lawmakers and business people to consider this a high priority problem, yeah. even though it is, you know, so I, I get it. I get the resistance, but yeah. um, it's a challenge. I don't know quite what the answer is other than to scream from the rooftops day after day, <laughs> day that we have to pay attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. It takes no small amount of education uh, of the people in, in the legislative bodies as well to understand the sort of the scope yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've, been okay. in the war, I've been in the war room when there's an active, phone call from an executive and all of a sudden their entire organization is looking to them. What should we do? And right. all of the investors are calling them saying, do we need to get out of it? Like they, you could almost see the gray hair sprouting yeah. in real yeah. time. It's so stressful for these people. Absolutely. And 
they are so relieved when somebody gets to the scene and is able to say, here's the next steps. Here's what we know. Here's what yep. we're going to know. Here's what we're going to do. They're yeah. just like, God, you're here. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, an, it's really, it's so time sensitive. So um, it's a really good thing to be involved in. It's really rewarding actually to be involved in those situations where you feel like you're contributing to a solution and you're being valued. Yep. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that, that's enormous. And that, that really brings a lot of job satisfaction, I imagine. So as we wrap up today, um, for, you know, we, uh, there's, a, there's always people writing to us saying, you know, I feel kind of stuck in my job. I want to do something different, but I've been doing help desk for however many years, or I don't feel like I know where to, you know, get started in a new thing. Like what would, what's one thing someone could do tonight that would get them closer to being a, a digital forensic specialist? Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, okay. on, just <laughs> awesome. Not, not that I'm, you know, have the power to, to change your situation, but it's, it's a start to getting yeah. known as I'm, as I was sitting here waiting for this to start, I, I had, you know, a, a recruiter on LinkedIn that I don't know saying, Hey, we're starting up this a really great position here. Do you know anybody? Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I actually do. Um, you know, we help each other. It's a really close knit community. So just start connecting, you know, um, it, it helps and it helps get your name out there. It helps you getting connected to the right people. And that's, that's where we are in the modern era. It's not a, you know, send out random resume. I could get a thousand resumes. Um, and if I get one well-crafted LinkedIn message from somebody who um, knows who I am and knows what they want to do, it, the message is received, believe me. So I would, I would go for authentic, um, you know, connections like that and just, start developing them as much as you can. I think that's the best way. That's awesome advice. Thank you for, for, for wrapping up on that. One last crucial question. Uh, if, our later, if our listeners do want to connect with you on LinkedIn or learn more about DFI Forensics, where can they go? Um, just search Tyler Hatch, uh, search mm-hmm. DFI Forensics. We're just under there. Um, if, you wanted, you know, if you want to know what we're like, I mean, I would say our Instagram page is really cool. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's some good information. I, I, I approach everything to be very genuine. I'm a very genuine person and there's a real human side to what we do and who we are. Um, if you want to know what my life's like, as boring as it is, if you like dogs and guitars and, you know, computer stuff, yep. you know, follow me on Instagram, you know, if you, yeah. wanna, you know, there's nothing special about me. I just happen to be doing this. Um, but I love it. And if you want to see somebody who's doing it and passionate about it, then, um, yeah, connect, get to know people. Um, that, that's probably the best way. Thanks. Well, Tyler, uh, thank you so much for being our guest today on Cyberwork. This was awesome. And I think we'll probably give people some, uh, some great directions if they, if they feel like they want to get started down this path. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Uh, and thank you all, as always, for listening and watching. Uh, new episodes of the Cyberwork podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central Time, both on video on our YouTube page and on audio wherever fine podcasts are distributed. Uh, also, don't forget to check out our hands-on training series titled Cyberwork Applied. This is a new thing. Uh, each week, expert InfoSec instructors teach you a new cybersecurity skill and show you how that skill applies to real-world scenarios. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash learn, uh, and you can stay up to date on all things cyber work. Uh, Keytron Evans is one of our great teachers, and he's doing the first rounds of these. So I hope you'll check it out. Uh, Thank you once again to Tyler Hatch and DFI Forensics, and we will uh, talk to you all next week. Thanks for listening. Bye now.